Welcome to another episode of For Lawyers Only, Practicing with Purpose. I'm your host, Cindy Watson, and today I am super excited to introduce you to Tamina Watson. So Tamina, it is so great to have you here. I'm so grateful to be here, Cindy. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and it doesn't hurt. With the last name Watson, I knew you had to be a kindred spirit. So <laughs> <laughs> Totally. It's a win-win with the WW2. <laughs> that was clever. I like that. <laughs> and today for our listeners or our viewers, we're going to be talking about finding purpose, passion, and success in immigration law. And for those of you who don't know Tamina, Tamina Watson, she's an immigration attorney. She's founder of Watson's Immigration Law in Seattle, Washington. And she helps both individuals and businesses navigate what can really be a lot of complexities in U.S. immigration laws. And in particular, I love that she loves to unite people, you know, unite loved ones, but also to be able to match up talent as well through the immigration process. And Tamina is a passionate advocate for immigration reform, which we all know is much needed and always a hot topic of uh, political hotbed. And she's the author of two books, and her most recent bestseller is Legal Heroes in the Trump Era, and I can't wait to pick her brain about that. She regularly advises policymakers and think tanks on immigration and related issues. And she's also the host of her own podcast called Tamina Talks Immigration. So be sure to check that out as well. And Tamina comes, she's a powerhouse. You know, she's got articles that have been published in the Seattle Times, Above the Law, GeekWire, uh, Puget Sound Business Journal, Scary Mummy Yes Magazine, and more, 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 the list goes on. She's also received uh, numerous awards and most recently in 2020 was named a woman of influence. So uh, sit back, roll up your sleeves and get yourself comfortable because you're in for a lot of great insights today. So Tamina, I just start to, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself you know, who you are and what made you want to pursue a career as an attorney? Well, thank you so much again for having me. I think the audience you have here is just perfect to share my story with because part of what you and I need to be doing is exactly what you're doing, telling people how to find their passion and how to keep the practice going while doing good in the world. Um, I, uh, if you haven't tuned into my accent, I am from the UK. I was born and raised in London. Um, I always wanted to be a lawyer and in particular, I wanted to be a barrister. I, my, my father was a barrister. I had a lot of lawyers in the family and I just thought that's what I'm supposed to be. <laughs> but the journey was actually very difficult. Um, you know, like in Canada, in the UK, we have barristers and solicitors and the training path is equally difficult. You know, you go to law school, which is different from the US. Yes. If you're a US lawyer, you know, you come out of law school, take the bar exams and you've got a practicing license. Whereas if you're in Canada and the UK, not only do you go to law school, but you have to have your apprenticeship, which is called a pupillage or a traineeship in the UK. And then you get your license. So without those traineeships, you are not a qualified lawyer, yeah, but the, yeah. the competition to get those traineeships is fierce yeah. and even more so to be a barrister. And it's only become more fierce, I believe, since the times that I was looking yeah. for my people. Yeah. So um, I, I was born in London for about 10 years. I lived in Bangladesh where my parents took us when I was little, came back, went to university and then went to the bar vocational, did the bar vocational course at a school called Inns of Court School of Law. It used to be traditionally the only place you could take the bar, um, except in, you know, recently universities offer the program too. And for all the UK listeners, I'm a Middle Templar, a big fan of Middle Temple. I did a, a lot of um, pro bono work um, held over there, the events. Um, once I became a pupil, uh, and I was very competitive, I did a lot of pro bono work to even get to the point where I could be considered a, a pupil. And my pupillage was at a chambers called Two Paper Buildings, sorry, Bridewell Chambers first, and then eventually Two Paper Buildings. And I became a barrister. And I, that's all I wanted to do in life, yeah, be a barrister. Yeah. It just so happens that I met the man of my life, my dream mm. man, I call him, as I was about to start my pupillage. And he was American. Ah. And so that's I had my pickings. own. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so funny. The entire life, you know, I just wanted to be a barrister. And suddenly I meet this man. I'm like, you know, maybe I can change my plans a little. 
Um, and so I eventually got married to my dream man. He's a patent lawyer in the US actually. Um, and shout out to my husband, Tom. Um, but then I moved to Seattle, which uh, from a weather perspective was gray away from gray. So I didn't feel <laughs> different. <laughs> um, but everything else was different. You know, even when you read, and your audience will appreciate this, you know, in, in the UK, when you're remanding a case, in, in the criminal courts, that's what I did. A, a, a case is remanded uh, and it means slightly different to what a remand means in the US. And so when I was studying for the US bar, I had to have a dictionary next to me to see what does this mean? Because I'd read a sentence and it wouldn't make sense. Yeah. What do you mean mm -hmm. the you're remanding a case back down? You know, now obviously it all makes sense, yeah, but, yeah. but there was a, you know, there was a translation that I had to do in the beginning. The other two things that got me a lot were writing the dates you know you know in the US you write the month and the yeah. day yeah. and the year and the UK you write the day and the month and so I had to get used to that I had to get used to you know swapping my z's or z's for s's yeah. or, you know, <laughs> s's for c's in defense so there was some you know um, language barriers I had to get over when I moved here well, I figure I, it had to be true love to to go through that entire bar experience again. So, and and did you end up finishing your pupillage in the UK, or did you did. end up moving? To, so you've got both. Good for you. That's nice I to did. have under your belt. I did. I was very very fortunate. I wasn't going to give up my pupillage <laughs> um, after working so hard for it. Um, I bet. Good for you. Yeah, I did. I did get my pupillage. I did qualify. I did a third six as well for any UK lawyers listening. Yeah. And then I got married and moved over. And talking with the bar exams, honestly, I didn't even want to take the bar exams. I didn't want to go to law school. I didn't know what to do. I didn't yeah. know how to become a lawyer here. And that is a story in and of itself. But long story short, uh, whereas anybody I talked to would say go to law school, I figured out with the UK bar exams and a UK law degree, I could take the New York bar yeah. exams. So I took yeah. the New York bar exams, but then it limited me in what I could practice in Washington state. Yeah. Like Canada, this is a federal, you know, system, unlike the UK. And, um, but immigration wasn't the one I wanted to do. I mean, immigration honestly yeah. was the last thing I wanted to do, but it kept following me around. And eventually, I succumbed. My father was <laughs> I succumbed. <laughs> So what was your passion? Just out of curiosity, Tavita, when you, if you'd had your druthers, what did you think was going to be your road? I thought litigation was going to be it. You know, as a trial attorney in the UK, yeah. a barrister, I thought the natural course would be a litigator. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, as you, as you come out of law school, you have all these idealisms in your head about yes what you're supposed to do, what the law is. You have these idealist, idealistic notions of changing the world, except then reality hits you that you've got to pay the bills, you know, yeah. and ultimately it's a business. And, but all of, I was still in that sort of like zone where I thought the law was, you know, this beautiful thing and I could yeah. change everything. And, you know, as the story of my, as our story of this discussion progresses, you'll see that I've made it into it, but there is this time where reality hits. So anyway, I thought it was going to be litigation, but Washington state would require a state bar. And in the US, the federal system um, means that maritime law, bankruptcy law, and immigration law, I think these were the three I could possibly practice. Oh, wow. Washington State and immigration kept following me but my father was a UK barrister practicing UK immigration law so I'd seen it and I thought it was just asylum day in day out I didn't really think it could be more than that yeah. to me asylum was going to be pulling on my heartstrings every day I just didn't want to do that all, all day yeah, every day but when I went through the immigration process myself my husband sponsored me to get a green card I already had a taste of what about. And then when I was looking for a job, my own immigration lawyer needed some help. And so once my green card came along, I started working with her. It was, um, and that's when I really succumbed to it because I really wasn't <laughs> getting any other choice. But at the time I thought to myself, I would do this for five years, wave into Washington and then do whatever calls me. 
Yeah. But day yeah. one of immigration, I realized this was my calling. It was going to follow me until I succumbed. And I love it. I love it because the very first day I realized it's not just asylum. You don't even have to look at an asylum case. You know, you are dealing with um, all different types of backgrounds of people, businesses, individuals, CEOs, battered women, um, everyone in between. But also the law is challenging. You know, it is yeah. in the US, it is second to tax law, as, as people say, you know, it's very complicated. And I was looking for that intellectual stimulus, but I was also looking for a way to help people in a tangible way. So in an immigration case, I can see the beginning to the end of a case within nowadays, it's about two years, maybe yeah. for Sometimes it's quicker, but you really make a difference. And the first time somebody screamed in my ear, dropped her phone, did a happy dance and came back and said, I'm sorry, I made you <laughs> deaf. That's when I realized how big a difference I'm making to somebody. You know, well, I'm they, so glad it ended up being a passion for you. I, I'm glad we got, I was beginning to think, well, this is it because the language about succumbing in that, I'm like, hmm, this doesn't sound like a passion, rekindle your spirit kind of story here. Oh, but I'm, I'm glad that you got there with that. Uh, I got there. Yeah, yes. the universe made me get there. They sort of pushed me into it to show me that this is what I was meant to do. And nowadays at my office, whenever there's good news, I'll say, hey, who wants the privilege of giving good news? Yes, because yes. it is a privilege, you, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about what's happening in Af Afghanistan and what kind of work we're doing here. But, you yeah. know, you touch a life and you touch a generation. Honestly. And sometimes it's beautiful when it follows you, I think, actually, because you know, and especially it's a good thing that you were so dedicated and knew you wanted the law because it sounds like on your journey, there were many opportunities that it, it might have been easier to just give that up and go somewhere else. But I love that idea about the possibility, being open to possibilities, being flexible enough to be open that when an opportunity presents itself, that you're open to exploring it, which it sounds like that you were. So I love that about your story. It's beautiful. Well, um, and tell me a little bit about some of the work that you're doing when you say what's happening in Afghanistan. I'd love to hear a little of the heart and what is it that really sort of refuels your fire every day mm -hmm. you know i think being in a position where i understand the law while also having this um immense compassion to save the people that i can make a difference to yeah um but that comes with experience so my day job just so people know i do have a day job and the day job is practicing business immigration and that's when i help um my clients are small to medium businesses generally um a lot of them are startups and i love startups um and my recent book actually just came out in july called the startup visa and it's actually uh it received reached number one on amazon and other um lists but just this week the audiobook released and it's hit number one and that's it can be fantastic fun. congratulations <laughs> we'll have to make sure to put the link in the show notes for you oh thank you i'm i i feel so privileged that i i can be a voice so what happened after the story of like just getting into immigration i realized I am truly making a difference to people. And I love that, that I can combine the law with the passion of really bringing the idealism back into my life. And so that has given me the training to understand the law, understand the complexities, understand how to present a case and how to, to make a, these cases win because the immigration system in the United States is very complicated. It's not straightforward. Even if you can meet somewhat you know, the requirements of the case, you still really need to build your case. Yeah. And I've been yeah. able to successfully do that and then mm -hmm. see where the gaps are to be able to advocate for those changes for my clients. And so that's how the writing began in like really advocating for these changes. And that's how all the books happen. But fast forward to the Trump era, and I'm gonna back up just a little bit. All of the changes that I've been mm -hmm. doing really made me realize I could be a voice. And so I, yeah. after writing the first edition of the Startup Visa book that I just mentioned, which came out in 2015 and was launched at a festival called, this, called South by Southwest, a big tech uh, festival, I was very fortunate to be 
selected to be in Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign working committee wow. for immigration. And at the time, between 2015 and 16, there was so much hope that we could see immigration reform when she was in office. Yeah. But when um, the election was lost, uh, as I like to put it, after crying for a week, yeah. <laughs> I realized that crying is a waste of time. Yes, I've channeled my um, you know, sadness into tears, but what's next? And I thought, well, I've got to channel that fear, that, that anxiety, that anger into something. And so I went to our local immigration lawyers uh, organization and said, you've got to give me a committee because we don't know what will happen when he takes office. Yeah. All we do yeah. know is there's going to be mayhem. Uh, he promised mayhem. And th at the time, a lot of people were like, well, he just did that to win the election. Yeah. Nobody yeah. really knew what was to come. But even if a tiny bit of what he said was going to be true, we needed to be ready. Yeah. And so I was given a committee and I recruited people. And, you know, Cindy, if you say committee to other lawyers, they run away from you. <laughs> uh, and so at the Christmas dinner, I, I did have a lot of people run away, but I managed to get 30 names, um, persuaded them that I'll just take a little bit of your time for your expertise. I took some of the things I learned in the Hillary committee and tried to, you know, organize that way. And we were trying to get in place what was writing memos about the things that he could do, but then the travel ban happened. And I think the travel ban is what was the catalyst to really all the things that I'll talk about, you know, thereafter. Because what I realized is a lot of us lawyers in the US stepped up, a lot of non immigration lawyers stepped up, a lot of non lawyers stepped up, but a lot mm -hmm. of people needed channeling and direction and guidance on where you can go and give that help. When you have a lot of people wanting to help, what is needed is leadership in guiding and putting that energy into focus so that it's directed and it's used well. And so the travel ban was the first experience of organizing in a mass way and then finding ways to collaborate with the people who have the skills that I don't. And, uh, you know, making sure those opportunities that come to you are, you know, grabbed onto with two hands in that moment. And so Airport Lawyer came along that way. We had um, some tech companies join some of our lawyers that were working on this. And we came up with airportlawyer.org, which was basically a web portal for distressed passengers to get pro bono lawyers to them wherever they were in, in the United oh, States. That's awesome. I hadn't heard about that. That's amazing. Yeah, it was really, really um compelling because all of the skills that were necessary came together and the enormity of the assault on the law was felt by all of us and so that helped make this happen and so there are so many people that were part of this um, I write about it in the book Legal Heroes and some of the lawyers that stepped up their stories are shared in addition to what I did and I think anybody who's a lawyer who really went into the law for the, the, the idealism of the law yeah. should read yeah. the book Legal Heroes because it will bring you back to why you became a lawyer. Billable hours, you know, life yeah. all sort of distracts you from those early days and the Legal Heroes book will bring you back to it and you will find ways to bring that passion back in purpose. Just the title of your podcast is just so profound. I love it. Well, and and I was going to say, it's that. interesting because that's one of the reasons that I started this. I felt so passionately about the fact because I, I think we all start the practice of law. The vast majority of people, I think, go into law because they want to make a difference in the world, right? They want to affect good. They want to affect some positive change. And then the way our system is set up is just so adversarial, so competitive, so zero sum, so win or lose that I think for many people, it ends up sort of beating the passion out of them and they lose their sense of purpose. So I thought there's got to be a better way to practice law and hence this practicing with purpose starting this. So I, I love your story on that. And I'd love if you could actually speak to it since we're talking about that. You and I just before we started the podcast here talked about how you know, women in particular seem to be leaving the practice of law in droves. Uh, you know, I think part of it is a challenge of getting getting up the system, but I think part of it is that loss of sense of purpose and passion. So what's your experience with that or any tips you have for uh, our listeners out there about how to rekindle that purpose and passion in your practice? 
such a, such a great question. And I come back to my book, Legal Heroes. In the book, I um, highlight 14 lawyers in total, in addition to my story. And these are 14 lawyers that really um, uh, are inspiring and they come from different backgrounds, nonprofit, private practice and solo practice, big law, medium law, you know, non-practicing lawyers, and they will share their, they share their stories. There's a podcast series, by the way. So the book actually derived from the podcast series. I didn't intend to write the book, but I realized that it's important for lawyers to, ex to do exactly what you're trying to make them to do. Love it. And these stories will tell you, you know, one of the things that happens is you're so bogged down with billable time, you don't have time to do the thing that you really want to do. But sometimes it may not take that much time. Yeah. It may yeah. be as a matter of 15 minutes or an hour of your time. But that thought of how you get to that hour is more challenging than doing that hour's work. Yeah. And these yeah. stories will ignite the, the inspiration that you're looking for. And so what I will say is the law is everywhere. Do you care about music? Do you care about art? Yeah. Do you care about climate change? Do you care about environmental law? You, do you care about um, school, our education system around the world has been affected by COVID? What calls you? Follow the passion that you have and put the law in it. What people will find is that your legal knowledge is what they lack in their nonprofits or their, their organizing. You can follow the passion you have and make a difference with the legal background that you have. Yeah, and we I think, need that. I think that's such great advice because we do, we get bought, we get sucked into sort of the traditional model. And I think when you're able to really just find those things that you feel passionately about and either take that as a practice area and run with it, which, which I think is totally doable. I think there's almost, I think you can make a practice out of almost any area if you really want to focus on it. And even if you're not that brave, if you don't want to niche down, I think even if you're in a larger firm environment, find those projects that you're passionate about, find a way to bring that passion back. I love that. And Tamina, I'd be interested because you spoke when you were saying about um, sort of in that election and, and, you know, with the Trump era and some of the anticipation based on the campaign about what was coming and the fear around that. I'd love if you could speak to what are, what are some of your biggest fears? You know, what are your concerns and how do you recommend, what are some tips you would have about how to address those fears and be able to move forward? Such a great question. How to address your fear is the first thing I'll say. I think fear is crippling to all of us. The challenge is how do you overcome it? And the way I have is to channel that into action. Because if I'm act actionable, if I'm doing something towards that fear, I don't have time to think about the fear and it goes away. It may, it may not go away, but it keeps fueling the action I need to take. Um, the fears I have when the election was lost, you know, I am a Muslim, I am a woman, I have a mixed race family, I have clients from all different backgrounds. I live in a community where South Asians um, were already being victimized after the election was lost, let alone after the inauguration. And I'm very integrated in my community. I had a live radio show, which really put me on the map, which is where you know people knew to come to me when there was a problem. I feared for myself when I feared for my community. And that was the biggest driver for me to find solutions. Um, and I think that's what people should take away. If you're, if you're afraid about anything, you know, it doesn't matter what that fear is. Find that solution first and drive towards it. And, you know, and that's something I try to make sure people at my office know. Because, you know, when there's a case and the government's asking these complicated questions, yeah. the first thing you think about is what did I do wrong? But the trouble is that you have not done anything wrong. It's just the system is that way and the officer is not accepting the argument or they're trying to buy time and they're asking for more evidence. Yeah. Yeah. More often than not, or, or, in, or in, in most cases, it's not because I've done something wrong. It's because now the government's asking. But as humans, our first thing is to say, what did I do wrong? Yeah. And so yeah. we, need to, we need to get over that and see immediately go to the solution because your fear will then subside and then you will get energized to find your way to that solution. 
Yeah. I love that. Feel, feel the fear and uh, go through it anyway. You hear uh, people often say as well, or use, I hear you saying, use that fear to fuel you, right? Just take yes. action in the face of it. I love that. Okay. And I want to I wanna address, I wanna address the woman thing that you mentioned earlier. Yes. The, the, one of the things that was very apparent, um, so after the airport lawyer, we started to hear the next big thing was the separation of parents and children. And that started, the news started to come out around January 2018-ish. And, um, you know, that fear of, uh, uh, not only did we then, I had the fears that I mentioned, but suddenly there's a fear of being a mother and what's going to happen yeah. to your child. And as a mother, every single one of your listeners who are mothers will have had a moment in the last four years when they didn't put their, themselves in the shoes of those mothers at the border. Yeah. It is impossible not to put yourself in those shoes. And what happened during that time is when, and again, coming back to the book, you'll hear about some of these women who stepped up. They stepped up because they couldn't sit back anymore. Yeah. You will yeah. hear from them who said, you know, I was donating to Planned Parenthood. I was uh, donating to ACLU, but there came a time where I couldn't sit back anymore. And so women have a special radar in our heads when it comes to children. You know, it's, it's, it's innate, yeah. it's, it's natural. And so what I will say about women, particularly, we are multitasking, we are so compassionate, we are leaders, and we're not always seen that way. What I need, what I want people to take away from this conversation is, your mother, if, especially if you're a motherhood, mother, but you don't have to be, take those leadership skills and make them into assets and make people see them as an asset. Yeah. Because yeah. how much juggling are you doing? You are juggling homeschooling. If you're lucky to have sent your children back to school this, this week, you're still homeschooling and juggling. But even before that, you were juggling homework and chauffeuring, but you're juggling your docket, you're juggling, you know, reporting back to partners, yes. you're yes. juggling so much. When you're juggling so much, that is your asset, because yes. you're not yes. dropping the ball, you are efficient, and you're de you, you lead with delegation. And that can, I often say that if women were running the world, we would not have this pandemic. We would be living in a different world. And I think, you know, your, your, your comment about women leaving the law in droves, when there's adversity, there's opportunity. Where are those women? Let's all come together and let's, what ignites you? Let's make you the law firm that you are dreaming of. Let's guide you in that. So I think maybe the next step of your podcast, Cindy, which is happening right in this moment, <laughs> is to gather those women and have a conference about what ignites you. Let's get you those law firms and let's make you the lawyers that you dreamed of yeah. because you can do it. It's not a zero sum game at all. You can have it all. Yeah. And I think we have to accept that in our heads. Well, I am smiling from ear to ear here because you are just so completely in line with my philosophy about on so many of these issues. I mean, one of the reasons, as I say, I started this and founded this idea about a better way to practice law and practicing on purpose. But prior to that and still continuing, I founded Women on Purpose and created programs that I call the Art of Feminine Negotiation and Persuasion. The idea being that for so long, we've defined success based on this masculine model. And we've seen those so-called feminine or soft skills as being liabilities. And in law, early in my career, I bought into that myth, right? And you know, my clients, I'm embarrassed now to say they called me the Barracuda and they meant it as a compliment. And then I had my epiphany, because when you really dig into the skills that make and mark the most effective leaders and the most effective negotiators, Ironically, five out of six of those skills are traits that people would consider feminine. Rapport building, empathy, flexibility, intuition, and trust. When people are surveyed, they will routinely identify those as being more feminine than masculine. We all have masculine and feminine energy. And the, the only, the sixth one is assertiveness. And I think people tend to characterize that as being more likely to be seen as a masculine trait. But I think that's because they often mistake um, assertive with aggressive and they're not the same thing. So I love what you're saying. And I actually think COVID has helped people take a pause and really think about the way that we're showing up, the way we're doing things. And for the first time in a long time, 
I see people recognizing these so-called feminine traits as strengths, as leadership qualities in a way that they haven't before. So I am totally on the same page as you. And with that, I talked about defining success. I'm always interested in how people define success. I would love to mean if you could share with us, how do, like, how do you define success? What does that mean to you? What does it look like? You know, I um, had an interview with NASDAQ that just came out last week and I'll make sure that you get it. Okay. Um, and it made me think about this question. I think at different stages of your career, success looks different. And, you know, I applaud you for being called a Barracuda because I think to survive as a lawyer in that type of environment, you have to follow the game, so to speak. You've got to be that. So at different stages of your career, depending on where your, your, your practice is, you have different goals. And for me, it was like, can I even have a law firm? I never really envisioned having a, my own law yeah. firm. I just wanted to practice law. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of us who go to law school don't necessarily know where we're gonna end up or where we wanna be. You wanna follow the crowd, uh, but you just wanna practice law. So in, in the early days, I just wanted to practice law. How do I become a lawyer? To me at that point, you know, I've got there then your goal increases and sort of expands. And so then I wanted these different types of clients. And, you know, you know that once you get those types of clients, maybe they're not necessarily aligned with you, but you don't know that because that's what you thought you wanted. And um, now at this stage of my career, you know, up until I guess in the last week or so, and it will, I just added some more things to it now uh, in the last week, but it's, really that I want to be part of the change in the law. I think I have um, the passion, the vision, and a personal mission to be able to be part of the change. Not everybody has the privilege of not doing the billable, billable hours, yeah. um, but I've created that for me at my law firm where I'm able to give time to the causes I want to. So I want to be part of the change. And so to me, success in the future, my legacy will be she was able to affect change by creating systems for vulnerable immigrants, by affecting changing the law. But I think, you know, what I, I have added in the last week or so, and I, it's so um, synchronistic that you and I are speaking. Yeah. The NASDAQ interview um, asked me about self-care and I have, really put a lot of time in self-care in the last four years. I, I was compelled to, because when you are a leader, and it takes a long time to sort of accept all the things I'm telling you. Uh, so I hope all the lawyers will take this with a grain of salt that I, don't, I didn't just come up with it. When I was leading the challenge of, you know, uh, lawyers, organizing lawyers and seeing what's happening in the community and the community kept coming to me, it's hard not to empathize and taking it all in. But you can't keep taking it all in without having oxygen yeah. on your own face. And what we do as mothers, particularly, you feel like you can do everything until you can't. Yes, so true. And when you can't, everything falls apart. Yeah. And I had reached that stage and I took meditation lessons. I actually went to a class to take them because the app wasn't enough for me anymore. <laughs> Same so had, you know, it's like you and I need to talk afterwards. I mean, there's just so much that's so aligned. But I had been do doing it for three years and I started to realize this Afghan situation, which I really do want to talk about, gave rise to that. So almost the same sentiments and organizing that I'd seen after the travel ban. While two different administrations, two very different ways of these occurring, the same thing was immigration lawyers were needed all over again in the same manner. And I could see that people like, I haven't slept in four days. I haven't slept in three days. Yes, you are needed. Without you, this will not happen. Yeah. But if yeah. you fall apart, it's going to be even worse. Yeah, none of it will happen. Absolutely. And so I had been wanting to talk about it, but I didn't really know if I had the authority to talk about it. Can I talk about it? You know, I'm, I, I want to talk about law changes, but I didn't really want to talk about leadership and why self-care is important. So this NASDAQ interview really brought it out of me. And they put it as one of their quotes. And I thought, you know, that's where I need to go next. I love because that. if you want the next generation of leaders, they need to understand that self-care is part of leadership. 
It is in, an imperative part of leadership, particularly for lawyers who really part of that competition, if you like, yeah. of yeah. the billable hours and making sure that you are dealing with all of the clients. Yes, all of that is necessary, but you are even more important as an individual. Well, and thank so you for that interview because how how interesting that you didn't have an awareness of that yourself and yet they were able to pull that out as one of the highlights from their interview with you and then you were able to see the resonance of how important that was. I love that. Yeah, well, I think it's it's, I was realizing that, but I didn't know if I was somebody who should talk about it. Yeah. You know, because you always think about people who have the niche expertise. Yeah. And yeah. I, I'm absolutely an immigration expert, but life has happened to me. And I can now talk about some of these things where I want to be able to um, support the people who are leading in different ways. Yeah. And so that's what I've added in the last week. <laughs> and so it's been, it's interesting. It's, uh, it's I think and that's where I'm going to go. So I think in the future, if you were to ask me, what does success look like? I think I'd be able to say, and I'm now projecting, but I think I'll say, how many more people have I helped in their own dreams mm. to get to being leaders? So not there yet, but interview me in a year and we'll see if I've got there. And I will do that because I love that because I think you've just hit on, I was going to ask you, how have you maintained your passion for the practice? And I've heard a couple of things so far. One is that impacting on that change to help lift other people up so they can be change makers and leaders as well. And I also heard you talk about that um, sort of moving forward to find your purpose and passion in being that change maker. So anything else you would say on that as well? Where what else helps you maintain that passion? Yeah, COVID has really allowed me to enjoy life a little bit more. And I'll say it this way. It's more like how many listeners that, of yours here as lawyers will say to you that they have hobbies? Mm -hmm. And the answer will be that they'll say, I don't have time for hobbies. Yeah, what are you talking about? so true. You know, and I, and I have been one of them until COVID struck. And when I was talking to some mentors, they, you know, I remember saying, what brings you joy? And I'm like, I love helping people, that's joy, but it's not the same. The reason you want joy is to keep your spirit uplifted. Yeah. And in COVID, I have discovered birds. I kid you not, oh, well, well. I have become a bird watcher. <laughs> I bet that was unexpected. <laughs> no, totally. <laughs> Uh, but it becomes even more bizarre because I've become a COVID photographer of birds wow. and I've now invested in like one of those telephoto cameras. And the biggest transformation I realized was last weekend where I was like, you know, I have this one hour window in the next two weeks where I can go and find some birds in this unknown area. And it was pouring down with rain and I was out there and I thought, who am I? <laughs> it's, it's so much joy that it really allows me to keep my spirit up yeah. so I can deal with these, you know, heart wrenching humanitarian crisis situations. Yeah. But if you, yeah. it's part of the oxygen on, you know, on my face. And the most bizarre thing is these birds were calling me to like, mm, you know, they're so beautiful. Maybe I can draw them. And <laughs> I was like, hmm. and I was getting blocked by like, I don't have time for it. When am yeah. I going to get paint supplies? When am I going to, you know, do this? And it just so happens I had a pen and I thought, yeah, let me just see if I can outline it. And I'm actually a pretty good sketcher of birds. I love it. I'm like, you where did that from you know I can sketch yeah. and so it feels rather magical but I feel as though all of these uplift uplifting emotions that come from nature for you whatever nature is to you whether it's hiking or trees or boating or whatever you want to do these are parts of you that will help you regenerate the things that are bringing you down the energy that's being depleted from you in your yeah. practice. And this is not just for lawyers. This is any profession. When I think about yeah. the doctors that talk about, oh my gosh, I can't do this anymore because the, you know, the non-vaccinated people are just dominating the beds. You know, it's for anybody, but for lawyers particularly, our practice is such that you don't think you have time, but it doesn't take that much time. Yeah. You can just yeah. do something for 10 minutes. Whatever Such it great is. advice. Such great advice. And, and multi-layers, because I, I heard you talking there, Tamina, about 
like finding those outside interests, which I think you're right, we become so tunnel vision, feeling like there aren't enough hours in the day, if we allow ourselves to get stuck in that mindset, that we don't believe we have the luxury of time to have any outside interest, when in fact the opposite is true. When you allow yourself, when you make it a priority to, to attend to some outside interest and allow yourself the luxury of getting creative with that, it adds that fuel and passion that you bring so you become more efficient, you have more energy for it and you can actually get more done. I, I love that great of it and also about getting out in nature. I think we often, it can be very easy to get stuck in that mind where you're stuck in the office, you go to the office, you're in the office all day, you leave the office, go home. Just as you say, even spend 10, 15 minutes just grounding yourself in nature can be so rejuvenating. I love it. And when you talk about other people and inspiring that leadership, and for you, that would be a definition of success that, you know, when you're helping to make change makers step into their leadership, what are some tips you have on how you inspire others to do that, to do the same? I don't know if I quite got there yet. <laughs> it's just a new, but what I have done <laughs> is I recognize that the next generation of, of women, the girls, I have two daughters. Yeah. Those, th my daughters are my inspiration to make sure that they are strong leaders when their time comes. And so with the meditation practice that I have uh, developed, I've had so many realizations about what we need to do as women. And, uh, but we need to cultivate that for the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. We cannot have our daughters face the same thing. So as COVID struck, I actually created a meditation program for children where famous meditation leaders and teachers and gurus donated their time for three months uh, daily. I created a roster. I'd never done anything like that. I don't, I'm not the meditator. I just knew it was necessary. I mean, the teacher, I just knew yeah. it was necessary. And that was at the beginning of COVID because I realized my daughters would not be seeing their friends on a daily basis. And at the time I thought it was only two months, like all of us did, <laughs> yeah. but I wanted them to make sure that they weren't feeling um, lonely and they could see their friends and have tools. But I knew they weren't gonna do it by themselves. So I wanted their friends to be part of it. And so that was a three month program as COVID had struck. But as you know, school ended and I started writing my books, I didn't have the time to come back to that. But this year I realized one of the role models in my mind is Jacinda Ardern. She Me is too. uniquely blazing a trail for women. Yes. And all of us should take note that we can blaze our own trails. We do yes. not have to do the same old, same old. Um, and look at all the things that she has accomplished. Yes. But how do yes. we cultivate that in the next generation of women or even this generation? And so I um, created, I built on the meditation program and added leadership skills to it. And I had two lawyer mothers who are now coaches come back and teach this course for girls so that um, these meditation is in my mind the first tool that we need as as human beings not just women yeah and on top of that we can add leadership skills and so that's the course that I had created and I want to build on yeah. um, but yeah. so that's where I've started again ask me in a year what I've done I but I really it. do oh, think wow. that uh, when people say to me how do you do so much it's because I've I've created the time for me. And I'll give you an example. I wake up at now at 5 a.m. so I can meditate, do my writing, and then do my work. Yeah. Um, yeah. But as school began, I didn't take into account that my morning routine that I've had for 18 months that took a lot of time <laughs> to develop suddenly is you know, interrupted because yeah. I suddenly have to make the lunches again and take to school. So I kept thinking, gosh, how do I get more hours in the day? I've got to wake up earlier. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to be able to go to bed at all <laughs> well sometimes my night my husband's a night owl you know he's a partner at a law firm and he goes to sometimes he goes to bed and I wake up <laughs> oh my gosh okay well you are a powerhouse I've got to say I love that you've got all of these different sort of uh, sticks in the fire if you will and all 
passion projects and all things that are going to make a difference in the world. So I kudos to you for that. And I got to say, we have definitely got to collaborate on something. As soon as you said about Jacinda, I'm like, oh my gosh, I speak about her often. Um, so again, bad. she's blazing her own path. And also, I think she's a gorgeous representation of, you know, what I call that, that art of feminine negotiation, seeing those feminine traits as leadership. I mean, imagine 20 years ago, a global leader talking about kindness, being their national language, right? I mean, I, I just love everything about her flipping things. She leans into the feminine and recognizes them in, as strengths and is so unapologetic about it. It is such a beautiful modeling. I love that. And I cannot believe how fast the time is going here. It is crazy. <laughs> We're going to have to do a um, sort of a follow-up as well, be able to have this, you know, with Tamina part two. You've just got so much on the go. I love that. And I'd love to ask you as well, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you'd first started and how would that have helped you? Because you've just been dropping so many gems here today. I can't let you go without uh, tapping into that for you. Um, let's think about this. I mean, you, one of the best advice that was given to me as I was starting my practice or hadn't quite started, I, I just moved here. My husband's um, friend's mother was a retired lawyer and she said to me, and her name is Stella Gold, just in case anybody uh, here knows that name, and an incredible woman. She said to me, life is not a race. Let things happen when they happen. And, you know, as a newer lawyer, you can't help but think life is a race. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you, and all of us will do it. We all do it because we want to get somewhere. But I think one of the things to know is, and the movie Sliding Door is one of my favorite ones. You will end up where you, you, you and I so have to do something. We'll have to talk after that. But life will happen. You will end up where you're supposed yeah. to have to be. But what I will say is cherish the thing that you're doing in that moment. Be present and do it well. Yes. If you can practice law well and you learn your craft well, you can apply it to other things. Yeah. And so let life happen, but be good at what you're doing and doing it with the passion that you're supposed to have. And if you're not passionate about it, passionate about it, go find something that is. But in that moment, do a good job with whatever it is on your plate. I love that. That is such beautiful advice. And I was going to such a perfect note to end on, but I know you have mentioned a couple of times that you wanted to chat briefly about the work you're doing for in Afghanistan or around Afghanistan. So I want to make sure you had a chance to share that if you want. Oh, so. thank you. Thank you. Yes. It's sort of been a follow up of all the last four years experience sort of culminating in this. What I recognized is that the need that is coming up to help Afghan refugees come to the United States at least is huge. The demand is so high. And my article that just got published yesterday should be in your links too. Okay. It's about yeah. making sure that the expertise of immigration lawyers are valued while supervising yeah. all the non-immigration yeah. lawyers. So I uh, um, helped create a training program where um, I didn't even think it would happen, but we had 850 lawyers from around the country sign up. Wow, it was gorgeous. Great. We had national leaders train in this program and we are getting the pro bono lawyers to some of the organizations that we're supporting. But at the same time, I'm now working on finding ways to get funding for the immigration lawyers so that they can supervise the non-immigration lawyers. So we're working on it. But what I will say is, Organizations need money, not just for uh, resettlement programs, but your mm -hmm. audience is the best audience to understand that the legal expertise that we um, develop comes with time yeah. and it comes mm -hmm. with, um, uh, you know, the work we put into it. And when there are only a handful of immigration lawyers to go around in all of this, if you do not value them for that expertise, you're not going to get that help you need. It's sort of a, um, a different side of the coin for putting the oxygen on your, on your face because yeah. you yeah. need to be able to build the capacity. So what I would ask your audience to do is to look up the website for Care Washington, Care Washington and PARS Equality Center in California. These two organizations are raising funds for legal help so that lawyers like my colleagues can go me. I'm, I'm just doing the, you know, the, yeah. 
advocacy work, but a lot of what lawyers are putting their, getting their hands dirty, they need funding for it. So if you can find yourself donating to one of them for the legal representation part of it, that would go a long way. And honestly, $5, $10, will build up to make a yeah. big difference. Yeah. But the lawyers, I want to set a precedent of really making sure that the outside lawyers who are coming in to help get some value for the time because this is their bread and butter. They cannot maintain the roof over their heads if they continue to do pro bono in the way that they yeah. do yeah. already. So your audience is the perfect one to understand that. Well, and we will be certain to plug that for you as well. Make sure any of the links that you've talked about of things you want, just flip those to me, Tamina. I would love, love, love to get those in the show notes for you. And let me just thank you so much for being here today. It has been an absolute pleasure. You are such a powerhouse and like you're truly a woman on purpose. And also you are practicing with purpose and finding and advocating for a better way to practice law. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And for all our listeners as well, if you want to learn more about Tamina, make sure to check out her website at watsonimmigrationlaw.com. Check her out on Twitter or LinkedIn as well at Tamina Watson. We'll make sure to have the links in the show notes for some of the other um, items that Tamina's referenced here. And I am sure you have all got loads of value from this episode. So if you haven't already subscribed, please make sure to subscribe to For Lawyers Only, Practicing with Purpose podcast. And make sure to share with any friends out there that you think could get some value from this. And let's face it, if you're in the practice of law, finding a better way to practice so that you can practice with purpose is something we could all benefit from. And also make sure to check out our For Lawyers Only Club on Clubhouse. We've got weekly rooms on how to practice with purpose as well. That's always a lot of fun. And that's a wrap for this episode. So until next time, go forth and negotiate your best practice on your terms so you can rekindle your passion and purpose for the law, always finding a better way to practice on purpose. Take care.